Hello all, and now we are going to continue our unit on Deleuze. Of course, we are looking at uh, the ideas, the famously original ideas of a thousand plateaus. And so, to really go back to where we left off, uh, we were focusing on the uh, two ways of articulation uh, of content and expression and its position on the uh, strata, on the anthropomorphic level. And so this, of course, begins really the plateau of, of signs, of semiotics. And so the sign regimes uh, have you know, four uh, ways in which they talk about here. And so this is similar, of course, to you know, in past metaphysical epochs where we would you know, have something like the Ur symbols or uh, Gebser and the conscious structures. And so, um, you know, when sign regimes, if they're destroy or, uh, uh, you know, where they emerge from is uh, a sort of a signifying uh, way in which the plane of consistency uh, will renew uh, or uh, reamalgamate, if you will, into a, a new abstract machine or a diagram. Um, to form new semiotics. This is, of course, uh, about process here. And so all the semiotics, uh, there's no pure semiotics, uh, which, of course, is uh, hearkening back to, uh, you know, metaphysics prior and how they examined these things. Uh, for DNG, uh, they're all mixed. There's no purity. There's no uh, competition between the, uh, you know, structures. Um, and so... Uh, the classifications here uh, are ones of the pre-signifying, pre which represents the tribal world, the signifying, uh, which is really the rise uh, of the state uh, with the Bronze Age. You have the counter-signifying regime, uh, or the uh, nomadic uh, counter, if you will. And then we have the post-signifying, which uh, ramps up really with the uh, Hebrews and uh, the subjectification, a sort of passional one. And so this is really building off of volume one with uh, Oedipus, where you have the regimes uh, of representation with the primitive or uh, pre-signifying uh, the barbarian with the despotic eye and uh, its paranoia and um, the signifying regime. And of course, capitalism then is a, is a mixture of the signifying and the post-signifying um, and so this, this sign counter uh, of the uh, post-signifying, they have that mixed uh, presence here. And so in a recap of, uh, really a recap, if you will, of the consistency uh, to the plane of organization, uh, you know, this is where, of course, all the strata take place, where each strata has the double articulation of content and expression, as seen with the pinchers on the uh, lobster example, the content and expression of the anthropomorphic level uh, or the uh, opposite of the content of the uh, alloplastic, which is basically tools. Uh, this is of course one of expression uh, in semiotics. And so this uh, uh, is the substratum uh, of the anthropomorphic uh, that Deleuze and Guattari are trying to focus on here. So the abstract machine is the diagram drawn on the plane of consistency that translates matter and function into uh, substance and expression. And so each has the double articulation. And so of course it's important to really point out what matter, uh, a lot of these conventional terms of course are, uh, you know, re-territorialized if you will, using their own words, um, uh, you know, from you know, you might have some preconceived notions of, of how these words uh, work, but of course in DNG's context this is different. And so the way you uh, think of matter uh, in the Deleuzian sense uh, is really the uncoded uh, flows or the differentials of, of speed or temperature that we talked about in prior videos. And so of course these are not yet formed, and because they aren't formed, uh, uh, they are uh, these... Impensi uh, uh, impensities, uh, excuse me, 
uh, that uh, we talked about in earlier Deleuze. And so the body without organs is this uncharted, uncoded set of flows that's always escaping the capturing order. Uh, so the organs uh, code the body uh, just as the state uh, uh, is an apparatus of, of capture or of different uh, captures that we'll get into. And so flows are allowed to either pass or stop um, in assemblages or um, in the prior volume, uh, the social formations. And so these intensities or uh, matter, if you will, on consistency is then translated in the machinic assemblages into substances that build the material world and its functions. And so, um, you know, the functions are put into sign regimes that humanity uh, makes sense of really uh, on a sort of linguistic level. So the two function process of the abstract machines uh, that ultimately organize uh, the machinic assemblages and then the uh, collecting enunciation that we talked about, or the collective. And so this is how the plane of consistency organizes the strata or uh, various sign regimes uh, by those abstract machines. And so moving on then, the pre-signifying has a mode or statement that are you know, plugged into each sign regime and so that's how this uh, makes sense to that particular regime and uh, each has a sort of different way of having a pictorial uh, faciality. And so the tribe is the one of uh, the mask. And so the despotic is always paranoid and uh, you know, requires signifiers to be coded or decoded by the priestly through interpretive acts. And so the desp the despotic uh, always wants to know what's, you know, the cosmic plan. What are the gods uh, uh, planning? Uh, you know, the sort of uh, ways of thinking about you know, sacrifice, giving on to the gods. Um, you know, what are they thinking of the citizens? You know, what are my uh, citizens actually up to? And so, you know, they're going to radically claim actually that you know, this isn't an evolutionary process. Uh, because these state captures always existed, but by the practices of these regimes, they you know warded off something like globalism or or, or the global capital uh, that we'll get into. Uh, such is the case with tribal societies with its uh, blood kin, and you know this really acts as a sort of repellent uh, as a pre-signifying regime. Uh, proceeds along uh, the construction of these lineages and, and clans that really disrupt any sort of molar aggregate or sort of you know abstract reasoning or rationality that you know comes later with uh, the state. And so the pre-signifying regime wards off the state from you know centralizing here. And so this the rigid line of interpretation. Uh, becomes of interest then uh, because this is ultimately how they you know send out these sort of these scapegoats as a sort of exercising uh, you know way in which um, the apparatus you know justifies itself and uh, you know in many uh, times these sort of acts um, you know act as a way of, of, of really converging uh, social distress or, or the micro uh, politics, if you will, uh, onto a, a sort of scapegoat that the, uh, that the state apparatus is, is uh, you know, sending out to send, you know, lines of flight in a sort of revolutionary way. Whereas the counter-signifying uh, really resonates with the nomadic war machine of, of smooth space, where the state apparatus codes and checks the flows uh, with the earth acting as a sort of body without organs, a landscape uh, uh, that creates the striated space. And so the nomads can destroy or de-stratify uh, the sign regimes back into the plane of consistency, ultimately to be abstracted again uh, in the creation of new semiotics. This kind of is a window into that process or one of the ways it happens. And so for the post-signifying, this of course began with the Hebrews and uh, it is the passion regime. The subject is uh, construction uh, and uh, the chapter uh, 
contrast this, you know, passional regime of to the paranoid one above, and so the subject never forms uh, into this sort of collective assemblages until the subject is introduced with the Hebrews uh, as a part of the passional regime of intense emotions, and so this is basically reliant on betrayal. And so there's no interpretation or, or priestly coding uh, for intense emotions of betrayal. And so uh, in the facial aspect now, God is you know, turned away from the subjects as seen in the Old Testament. And so we can never actually see the face of God outside of Moses who you know, is actually harmed from God's sight. And so this is fundamental to that particular regime of you know, God facially turning away from the people. And so Jesus, of course, is betrayed on the cross by his father uh, who abandoned him. And you know, these are just a couple of the examples really of that uh, betrayal aspect here. But then moving and meandering through to um, you know, classic psychoanalysis uh, really, of, of Freud, uh, who you know hides his face as the ultimate expert, and so this is a sort of echo of the the faciality of, of betrayal, of turning away, and so this creates the point of subjectification for DNG, which is a fascination to an object or a thing, such as the case of the Hebrews to God. Uh, Moses becomes the subject of enunciation with the Ten Commandments as a sort of replacement for his face or judgment uh, with you know, the book being brought down, which brings about uh, you know, the subject of statements uh, or you know, the expressions of, of the Hebrews as a people. And so the subject of the statement uh, ends up being uh, you know, what dominates discourse of that particular regime. Uh, and so the point of subjectification is um, Something similar to how you know love in, in psychology and in extreme emotional states, and so you know it, whether it's the love of, of a romantic person or in the case of the portrayal of the anorexic towards food, who's you know vomiting and food is betraying the anorexic. This sort of you know fetish creates the subject in the person's worship, and so then with mixed semiotics. Uh, uh, of the interpretation regime. Uh, you can see psychoanalysis in that sort of fashion. We have the analysis and the passional aspect of the subjective, uh, but of course they're not a, you know, a pure form, uh, but still this generates out of the plane of consistency that generative aspect of this classification to how they come about, but um, you know, the transformations were certain laws of semiotics can be put into transformations within each regime, uh, such as symbolic transformations for the signifying regime. Uh, the counter nomads uh, was one of polemics, and the post signifying is really the one of conscious or uh, sort of mimetic related uh, mimicry, if you will, in a sort of uh, vulgar way of looking at it. And so we can see really in the appropriation of music, uh, this shifts to a symbolic one of the artists and translate it, such as, you know, Christianity really recoding to, you know, different sects of, of people across the world. And so this is how, uh, you know, new semiotics really come about from that diagram of the abstract machines on the uh, plane of consistency that organizes uh, ultimately the assemblages of enunciation as well as the machinic uh, and how those bodily affairs uh, you know, relate uh, to one another. And so the abstract machine uh, of the uh, idea of, of one's romantic love uh, you know, draws the diagram of the machinic assemblage of man and woman in, in chivalry uh, and so the collective enunciation then of, of, chivalry, of chivalry is done through, uh, you know, the enunciation of, of, of romance, uh, one's vows, if you will. And so the machinic assemblage always 
uh, effectuates the plane of these abstract machines of content and expression, which really is the glue that holds human culture together. Uh, in and of itself, it's very strata colliding of, of these different mixed semiotics. Uh, this offers a real picture into how, you know, in today's world, of course, especially with modern technology, you, you know, we have no real distance between uh, you know, different peoples, different ethnic groups. And so, you know, we're seeing this uh, confrontation happen on a more macro level than never before. And of course, perhaps in the background, though, we're, you know, creating new cultures, of course, with uh, the Internet and memetics and how that relates to us of, you know, totally different ethnic groups uh, coming together for such a, uh, a thing. Where, you know, there is a sort of, uh, you know, culture creation here happening out of these confrontations. Uh, and so, of course, you know, metaphysics and, you know, strict arborescent you know, models of these different structures uh, can't really account for, um, you know, the way these assemblages operate uh, on a sort of macro level or, or, or how the molar aggregates uh, or the abstract machines, if you will, of uh, each different ethnic group that they say. Uh, so uh, just to continue, every ethnic group has a sort of semiotic it's always undergoing this process, this transformation um, uh, uh, through ethnic collisions. Uh. And so this brings us to the plateau discussion on how does one make yourself a body without organs, which is a very uh, distinct plateau, I think, in the book. And so you have these surface of inscriptions where things are coded that implies uh, an energy of desired potential that is uh, unformed and you know non-material but of course it's wrapped up into matter uh, of intensities of different gradients and potentials so we could see society as a coding of flows or social formations uh, and we're always having you know something move through this system such as mates with a, uh, you know, someone like Genghis Khan, for example, or, you know, the water and, and agriculture uh, in the small towns. And of course, in today's world with electricity and the grid. And so the codes are stoppages to let something else pass. And so society really is based on flowing desire. The system in itself desires its very own uh, repression. And so you have the creation of codes that make um, you know, the flows uh, unanarchic. Uh, a society cannot be without the coding of these flows. You would just have you know, just free-flowing desire. Of course, this doesn't really exist. Uh, the abstract machines are always there. But um, nonetheless, a society really is about you know, the coding of those flows and what's allowed to really pass through. And so the body without organs uh, is a really desiring a vitality, uh, a vitalist perspective, really, of energy that's seeking outlets moving through the strata. And so the body without organs is, of course, positioned on the plane of consistency as a sort of metaphysical field or continued intensities. And the body without organs is the uncoded surface waiting to be written uh, in compliance to the strata, uh, causing a sort of formal organization into um, uh, what would become the closest to forms, really, uh, for DNG. And so, on the organic level, uh, this is the process of an organism. Uh, but the body of without organs isn't uh, opposed to just you know the organs themselves. Uh, but having a sort of specific unified organization within that organism itself, this you know creative force really that wants to escape out of organization amongst the uh, organ, and so you could think of it really as uh, chaos, uh, uh, and of course he always uses or they always use chaos and complexity really to to back what a lot. Of, uh, of what they have to say in their metaphysics. And so, you know, you can see that really as the sort of vitalism of, of pure desire seeking outlets uh, where, you know, the strata are uh, 
more in line with uh, forms and, and principles and a sort of uh, a priori grid that you know capture um, and, uh, this sort of vitalist chaos. And of course, within that structure, the, the chaos wants to escape. Uh, but this doesn't necessarily mean that the body without organs is uh, antagonistic against organisms themselves. Uh, so it's kind of an important distinction that I think really is a theme throughout all of their polarities within the book. And so uh, this can create blockages, uh, or in the case of the priest uh, or the psychoanalyst, and so the body without organs uh, really is the sort of enemy uh, as they try to, you know, figure out coded repressions and, and to put stop gaps uh, and taboos uh, into the psyche uh, with regards to, you know, free flowing desire. And so uh, if we apply, are applying uh, the signifying of interpretation uh, through psychoanalysis, uh, um, you know, we're seeing someone who wants to code and interpret how the patient and their desiring energy is tracing, uh, but this doesn't account for what the actual energy wants to do and, and ultimately avert uh, the very tracings uh, to ultimately make new assemblages and, and connect out. That's really the goal of, of, of this energy is to make new assemblages. Um, and so the schizo is always connected to this inorganic world in their model, or their open-ended model as they refer to it. Uh, whether it's a bizarre figure, uh, you know, you're they're constructing new assemblages that connect new circuits. So the body without organs then reshapes and reconfigures uh, to make this energy pass through those new assemblages. <coughs> but again, to ask, how do you make yourself a body without organs? Uh, such as the case with the drug addict or the hypochondriac or the masochist uh, fetishizer. Uh, the hypochondriac is constantly trying to war with his organs from environmental assault, whereas the drug addict uh, you know, it, it, it is one of intensities of coolness of, uh, of a body without organs where the organs are really shutting down to experience these differentials of, of intensities. Uh, and the masochist constructs the body without organs by sewing up and shutting down uh, and closing off uh, his functions to where new codes of, of pain intensities are created. And so this is the construction of new assemblages out of the body without organs, as each is contained as a field of potential to be coded in a process. As such is the case with the man, woman, uh, and, and, and horse. In the masochist who identifies as a horse, where the horse has codes of inscription from, you know, society such as horse racing, uh, or how we, you know, discipline them, or, or feed them, or race them. And so the human becomes animal and identifies uh, with the horse to create a new circuit of, of new energy flowing from that new body without organs. And so D&G is really wanting uh, us to act in a doing of experimenting as opposed to trying to conform interpretations of the signifying regimes with uh, you know, presuppositions, uh, prefixed, preordained structures uh, that ultimately go back to the Oedipus uh, interpretation of family ties, uh, as is the case with uh, little Hans in their uh, example. And so the schizo is always referred back into the signifying and uh, subjectifying regime of the dictator being the father role or you know, the mother's neglect uh, or lack of love. Um, and so on the organic uh, stratum uh, in the two regimes of the signifying and subjectification, this binds us, uh, but the body without organs, of course, is trying to escape with different lines of flight onto the plane of consistency to flow energy into other channels which creates new assemblages. And so the question really is how do you dismantle or disorganize by creating a new map uh, through exp uh, experimenting? And so this takes a uniformity role uh, of, of experimenting and then drawing onto. 
And so uh, in a weird sort of way, you can actually see that they're essentially asking for moderation or to be prudent with, you know, tracing these flight paths as you experiment, you know, uh, maybe the drug user, you know, uses a certain dosage, but you, know, you don't want to get too disorganized to where you can't really be empirical in, in your becomings. Um, and so um, moving on then, the regime of the ego or, or subjectification uh, and interpretation uh, you know, de-stratifies by experimenting and allowing the body without organs to uh, you know, make new assemblages such as the animal or in a micromolecular level of, of plants. And so this emphasis is really on experimental states that allows new energies into new becomings and de-stratifying the ego and puts the tracings of lines of flight onto the new stratum the way as opposed to, uh, you know, molar interpretation as discussed earlier. And so the experience of creating uh, new energy in, in the new line of flight uh, is of course constructive of new forms of consistency uh, which is not into the strata of, of sign regimes. And so the body without organs is a continuation into the matter bounded up into it, uh, trying to escape into those new flights or deterritorializations, which is then reconfigured into new assemblages. It's a sort of desiring energy that is a repellent towards actually unifying energy. It desires to escape paths and find uh, new territories. And so, of course, that's a very important thing to consider uh, with how, you know, they're really trying to, um, you know, rebuke, uh, you know, all the prior ways of looking at forms uh, before. And so, really, if we we're going to do an upshot summary here, the trappings of the body without organs in the strata that is ultimately trying to escape to you know, create new assemblages or new circuits uh, is escaping the organic strata and the two regimes of signification and uh, subjectification. And so cancer uh, is a good example really of, of, a, of the form of the body without organs uh, de-stratifying itself on the micromolecular level of multiplying cancerous cells by the body and ultimately converting the host, the body has to imperialistically uh, hold it together and try to you know, contain those uh, cells as they uh, reproduce by the body. And so the body without organs, of course, can be destructive uh, in its embodiment through the strata uh, in anarchic and volatile ways, such as the same with the society has you know, micro -tumor, uh, microtumors of many revolutions, such as the example of fascism, as we'll getting uh, we'll be getting into, you know, being these small microaggressive uh, actions onto the wider society, and so this means that lines of death can happen if you're you know trying to de-stratify too quickly. Um, but moving on, then uh, we are going to discuss the plateau of, of faciality. Uh, or um, year zero, which of course is the Christ event. And so Christ then uh, signifies, uh, you know, the average face of, of the white man on society. And so the face is hidden in the mask uh, and is a product of the signifying and subjectifying sign regimes, uh, whereas in the pre-signifying, uh, it was put back into the animal. You can think back really to a lot of native art and how uh, the animal head and the human head are, are kind of one and how you know they wear uh, the animal head uh, you know within their face um, and so um, the head um, or, or de-stratifies de becoming animal such as with uh, native art as I just said uh, and so becoming animal where the animal is worn over the human face that's really uh, significant for the pre-signifying regime to them. And so the head is decoded from the rest of the body then and separates into a holy system of a system of holes, uh, whereas the prior society it was one of the bodily cavity. 
And so if we were to look at uh, you know, the mouth and the breast uh, as a sort of example of the assemblage of the bodily cavity, uh, the face then is a deterritorialization process or sort of creation from the prior regime. Uh, this determines where an organism you know, goes along the strata to be occupied ultimately. And so the human uh, has, of course, the most processes or, or deterritorializations. Uh, this is the most shifts that you see, um, and it's the anthropomorphic strata, such as the hand um, as a deterred paw. And so the tool uh, to the hand is a deterritorialization of the branch, or the one of the breast of the woman is a deterritorialization of the mammary gland. Uh, and, and the mouth is a curving out of the mucous membrane. And so these are, of course, these different anthropomorphic uh, deterritorializations, uh, such as the case with the animal snout um, creating the, this is a, uh, as a new assemblage. And so the head is relative from the animal, but the face is purely deterritorialized from the rest of the body. Uh, the landscape that goes... Uh, with the head and face, uh, the landscape is a deterritorialized world in and of itself, they would argue, uh, such as the forest turning to the creation of the steppe and the production of the world into ultimately one of human culture. And so all of these processes determine where the strata is going to organize itself uh, as, as such as the face is put into the signifying sign regime um, on two folds. You have the traditional signifying regime faciality uh, with the Bronze Age production of the state where the despotic uh, is an assemblage of, of power. And then you have the face of subjectification and betrayal or passion in profile, the two really mixed together to form Western Europe uh, where the process of all the pre-signifying tribes ultimately got Christianized. And so the semiotic tribal world was dismantled and destratified and recoded by the mixture of uh, significant and subjective. So now we're seeing really how um, the, you know the, our current regime came into being. Um, but continuing with the despotic power, uh, this is an assemblage of enforcing of overcoding and one of the the passion subjectification uh, is an authoritarian assemblage by contract. And so faciality then is, is governed by its own abstract machine, uh, which is the case of the white wall black hole abstract machine. The white wall is the backdrop upon the black hole uh, where the face appears and is uh, subscribed to. And so this is of course a, a huge shift away from the bodily uh, corporeal element such as you know, tribal societies becoming animal and uh, traditional pre-signifying, uh, which is dismantled to the white man's face as the primary means of overcoding that very system. And so this, of course, is the basis for racial seclusion. Uh, and so Western Europe uh, um, and those who do not assemble uh, in that facial recognition are ultimately sliding into a pre-existent social face, the minoritarian, if you will. And so the recognition of the facial archetype is the first aspect. The second is its uh, affirmation of, uh, as one glides into that preordained signifying face of, of this regime. And so the medium is either going to reject or accept the faces that glide onto it into those sign regimes uh, through uh, an affirmation or a deferral um, and, and by uh, its identification of the face this ultimately maps onto the overcoded regime of the face that favors that very society and so to do a, a real quick recap here I'm just trying to be as thorough as possible since there's so many detail details here with uh, um, a thousand plateaus uh, but to rehash here. The signifying despotic regime is one of paranoia and interpretation of the priestly uh, as coded amongst the gods, whereas the passional uh, regime emerges with the Jews and is based on betrayal. 
And so the two diagrams of the signifying regime in terms of face with the eyes, you know, that go from a center periphery to the four-eyed machine, such as the master-student relationship, or, uh, you know, a judge and a prisoner, the eyes in the despotic can uh, peripherally proceed uh, in concentric signifiers that ultimately form a periphery that certain elements are either included or excluded from, uh, whereas the subjective regime focuses on that black hole tracing the line of flight you know, onto that black hole in and of itself. The subject is a black hole or point attractor, uh, such as the case with Christ and Judas, where they trace a line of abolition into the, crucif uh, into the crucifixion, uh, where the subject can uh, staple down onto the obsession of a single black hole or faciality, such as the face of the beloved in uh, uh, you know, the, a state of romance. And so you can see really that you, know, you, you have this sort of mixture here of these two. And so the dismantling and process of destroying the face, uh, this is of course allows uh, the boundaries into a new uh, diaphragm onto the abstract machines to create a new sign regime. Defacialization, uh, de as they would call it, or escaping the overcoating of the dominant system uh, or reality. And then we're going to move then to the chapter of Micropolitics, or 1933, which of course is the rise of fascism in Germany. And so of course this is a concern with the micro and macro politics. There are two different types of segmentaries. Uh, there's the primitive micropolitical, um, which is a sort of broken line uh, as compared to the molar line or the macro, which is the rigidness of the state macro uh, apparatus. But of course, with DNG, there's always this sort of third hidden or fourth uh, you know, hidden thing that kind of uh, relays into all the other uh, descriptors above. Uh, and this is the third line, or the quantum flight, uh, which is, of course, the nomads. But uh, continuing to, the society is really segmented into a binary of classes, such as man and woman, or um, the proletariat and the bourgeois. Um, or in the case of segmented into or different stages of our life projects, or uh, different enclosures or institutions, if we want to use uh, Foucault's uh, words here. And so as we move through life, uh, uh, there's a sort of segmented basis for this. And so to look at the three classes of segmentaries, uh, there's the binary types such as the man and woman or the bourgeois and the proletarian. Uh, or secondly, there's the constricted circles such as the movements uh, to my neighborhood, to my town, to my state. Um, and so you have this linear uh, segmentation moving from one project to the next, always in a procedure, which is the case of, uh, you know, going from an institution such as, um, you know, elementary school to middle school to high school. You, know, you have these different um, institutions and ultimately into the workforce or uh, in the case of criminals, you go to um, um, you know, prison which is, a, of course, a different institution of punishment. And so each class has a supple and, and rigid type of the uh, fluidity. The supple is the fluidity, uh, which is compared to the molar rigid lines. They see the supple as along with the pre-signifying uh, regime of territory versus the rigidness of the state apparatus. And so the supple is associated with the molecular binary form, which of course was done with clans and lineages, uh, and the man and woman binary is determined by it. Uh, but the social organization uh, the, itself, the machine, uh, isn't a binary. And so the binary organizations under the state apparatus, the rigid line, is in and of itself a binary and presupposes one of the terms such as affluent uh, or a man over a woman. Uh, this is, of course, privilege, if you will, uh, consider it in contemporary terms. And so this is how the two functions uh, work as supple versus rigid. 
in the two differing societies in the binary mode. Whereas in tribal societies, the circular mode of segmentation uh, is, is the way of power is distributed or surveillance. So you have the shamanic representation of those different black holes of the varied animal totem spirits uh, where the shaman obsolescently unifies onto the world tree uh, that you know connects the three distinctions of heaven, our world, and the depths of hell. So the shamanic world trees are, are connected by that shaman in a circular way, whereas the rigid line of segmentary in the state apparatus, uh, the nuance of the animal eye as a sort of multiplicity is devolved uh, and done away with into faces on a macro level. The, fi the single face then, or faciality, is all seeing where the state uh, in its paranoid, despotic eyes is the all-knowing and seeing of uh, as the state. The sort of um, play on surveillance here. Uh, and certainly the case where you, you know, one could associate the despotic eye with the modern smartphone. It always just seems like we're being recorded somewhere in some capacity. You know, I have, I'm staring right at my webcam right now so I'm on a sort of surveillance for you guys. Um, and so the main theme is the two politics of, of the micro and macro uh, politics. Uh, the micro or molecular line or molar aggregate. Uh, these are always bounded by the center state. We are bounded by the macro such as uh, perception and molar aggregates but ultimately are undone by the micromolecular line or the subliminal perceptions that interact uh, between those molar aggregates to cause transformations, of course. And so in the analysis of Kafka, um, or Kafka's analysis of the molar line of bureaucracy or the rigid line, and Kafka represents uh, the trial that analyzes the displacement of each micro person in this giant labyrinth machine of, of the state uh, apparatus and of course from below they erase the lines of uh, the machine and so fascism for dng works uh, so well because it was uh, pretty uh, well, it was preceded by the vast micro politics uh, such as the nazi youth or, or the peasants and the, and the farmers uh, you know these small micro complaints if you will uh, consolidates into you know the, uh, the war machine that ultimately actually overtook the state apparatus and created the fascistic uh, regime and so the nazis then uh, code that war machine onto the state uh, creating uh, a very distinct totalitarianism and this of course contrasts to how they see communist stalin uh, which of course had more fluidity uh, but of course it had a very strong um, code that the state apparatus uh, prevented those micro politics uh, from escaping uh, the overcoding. So it sort of uh, works uh, as a sort of contrast there. And so the tribes, uh, empires, and nomads, uh, the primitive and nomadic are stateless as compared to the apparatus uh, each of these three types has its own abstract machine uh, in its own governance. Um, and so the tribe is coding over the full body of the earth by the formations of blood ties and lineages, which of course was made to deny the state apparatus uh, from evolving, even though it was actually, you know, could have been there to begin with. And so the state apparatus is uh, one of overcoding and the use of machinic assemblages of the state to capture flows, avoiding the spilling of the quantum uh, nomadic uh, lines. Um, and so we always have escapes or ethnic groups deferred from the state's overcoding. And so the line of flight or mutation of the decoding of flows is always moving into these new areas to ultimately deterritorialize them. Um, as is the example of the Roman Empire uh, in the barbarian times where ultimately you have this domino effect of the Huns uh, knocking into the Ostrogoths 
and the Ostrogoths into the Visigoths, uh, and then the crashing of the Visigoths into the Limes, which of course sends Rome um, cascading into just utter chaos. And so the rigid molar line, or macropolitics of Rome's obsession of those boundary acts, where the Huns are the nomadic lines of flight coming you know, into the war machine, coming to being through it. And so the barbarians represent the, the, that primitive tribal regime, uh, which is of course between crashed into that primitive line of segmentarization, which is a fluid line changing some of the Visigoths, um, which of course they could have turned into mercenaries or uh, ultimately they you know, ran off into their own territory. Uh, the Vandals would go to North Africa. The Astrogoths um, was ultimately absorbed into the Huns. And so, you know, you have different flight paths uh, out of this. And so there's this constant process of cultural transformation out of the lines of segmentary outside of civilizations um, where they are taken up barbarians or dejected uh, ethnic groups that introduce new sign regimes or segmentaries. Uh, brought to the higher molar aggregates of a civilization. And so as is the case with the Nazi war machine, the war machine comes in such as the nomads destroying the state apparatus or uh, the apparatus objectifies itself to the war machine. And so this is an important distinction here. Um, so the state apparatus really uh, will you know, use uh, the capacity of the war machine ultimately being, you know, a piece of the apparatus, but ultimately not um, its fully uh, embodied uh, or, or telos in a way, if you will, as we'll get into, I think, better later. Um, and so you ha uh, ultimately have the state apparatus, you know, using or co-opting, appropriating the war machine to use as its own ends and, and purposes. And so the war machine is the process of the mutation or lines of flight that transforms the civilizational aggregates of coding uh, that the apparatus does. And so the fascistic difference was the war machine replaced the apparatus. Uh, Paul Virilio goes into depth with this. On, uh, he describes it really as a sort of suicidal uh, mission. And of course, many of the Nazis did commit suicide in the end. Um, because ultimately war uh, was its only rise and, and, and objective. Uh, and so once the war ended, uh, it too was going to end, or at least the way of it being a sort of uh, state apparatus in and of itself. And so I think this is a good stopping point for this video discussion before moving on to becoming animal, which is of course a very influential idea a uh, very famous idea that D&G offer us. And so this, of course, is just, um, you know, discussing some of these middle chapters or plateaus here in A Thousand Plateaus and some of the main concepts and ideas that uh, one can find within them. And I hope I did it as much justice as I can. Of course, D&G is famous for their details uh, and detail orientation. And so there's only so much you can possibly do in a format like this. But nonetheless, I hope you guys enjoyed watching it. And uh, make sure to subscribe and like uh, as we continue our readings here uh, before moving on to more postmodern thinkers uh, to come, uh, for sure. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys for the next one.